many have heard that term worldview? Well, then good. A, a good many of you have heard that term. Let me try to get it um, into your into your mind this morning. You might understand where, where I'm coming from. I think it's really important that as Christians that we live a life that's consistent and balanced and spiritual. I mean, all the time. That we're to live a spiritual life all the time. And, and the, the Bible's pretty clear about the life we're called to live. A life in the spirit by which Whatever it is that we might say and whatever it is that we might do, that we do it as unto God. So that our life is a continual working out our salvation. Not working for our salvation. Christ has done that. But working it out in the marketplace of life. Working it out as we live our lives so that Christ is in us as we're in Him. So a worldview is often for people uh, not very thought out. Let me, if I can, for a moment, I think for Christians too. It used to be, at least, uh, I, I knew more people in the day that, that they, could, they could go to church on Sunday and, and, and feel good about it because it was like they did a good thing. You know, going to church at one time was a good thing. Now it's becoming a tougher thing. And for the world, probably it's a bad thing. But for us, it's an essential thing. In fact, when I first, just a little sidebar, when I first decided, no, we are not closing this church ever, is the first time I heard the governor say that the church is not essential. Then I thought, oh, this is an enemy issue. It's not just a political issue. It's from the enemy. And we will not act unessential. We are essential, and we've not closed since. But anyway. Now I'm off track. So, uh, so the, the, the point is, is that we find that people lived often uh, a, a life that isn't consistent. They would go to church and they would feel good about going to church because they did their, their, their spiritual thing and, and their kids went to Sunday school and then, and then they'd go home and live their life as though they had never went to church. I mean, they had a spiritual sense of things and, and they figured that the, that the Sunday school teachers were raising their kids in the way of the Lord, but, but none of those things were true. In other words, uh, consistency is really what your kids are going to learn. Your kids won't always do what you say, but they'll always do what you do. And so, you know, we, we have a generation of kids that grow up who don't walk with Jesus because their parents really didn't, though they went to church. That's just the way it was. And, and, you know, you'd go to church and you'd be a good guy at church, but, but you know, you, you, you'd cheat on your wife or you'd cheat on your taxes or you'd, you'd just cheat. Or, or, or you'd, you'd, you know, you'd, you'd just, you know, try to take advantage whenever you could take advantage. Because that was life. It was just, you know, it's life. You know, Gary was kidding, but he said, you know, the, uh, um, the, the, thing, the next thing best to, to godliness is cleanliness, right? Well, that's not in the Bible. But we have these little sayings that we think, oh, that's, that's what the Bible says, but the Bible didn't say that. And there a lot of other things the Bible didn't say that people thought the Bible said. But, but a worldview is really a, a knowledge or a belief system that you're living through. And, and what does that worldview consist of? It consists of things like this. Where you believe you've come from and where you believe you're going. I mean, really, the essence of where you've come from. Uh, that, you know, that you've come from a God who doesn't really care about you. You, you just were made. Uh, the world was made, and, and God made people, and then it's kind of like a clock he wound up, and it's just doing its time, but he's not really engaged. And, and so we know that there's a, another being, a God, but he's not really intimately involved with us. We're just called to work it out. Uh, uh, so, some might believe that there's no God at all, that you're a product of time plus chance plus energy and, and you're just this, your, your, your beginnings are kind of accidental. And your family tree is apes. And before then, some other, you know, single cell animals. 
And, and there are others that, that believe that, uh, that there are many gods. Not just one god, but, but there's one primary god, but there's other gods. The god of nature, and the god of the seas, and the god of you know, all that. And so, so your worldview will consist of where you believe you essentially have come from, and where you're going. If you believe that uh, when you die that this is it, that then your worldview will, will consist of living a life in light of that ending. If you believe that when you die here, you're going somewhere else and it'll be based on how good you are or not, and of course you'll determine the goodness, but all of that is, is going to determine how you live your life if you're living that worldview. For Christians, we believe these kinds of things, that, that God loves us and created us because he loves us. And he created us to love him back and to love one another. And he created us with, with an end in mind that, that we would get back to paradise. That we would have a heaven. That life doesn't end here. And so as Christians we have that beginning and that end in our minds. But not only that. We as Christians have a belief system that tells us uh, what, what's good and what's bad. What's right and what's wrong. We have, we have a sense of morality that comes from the God that we say created us. And so our worldview consists of these things and more. And really the grid or the window by which we interpret our world is the scriptures. I've said this before, there's a reminder. So, so we get to know the Bible because it's through the Bible that I, that I understand something about integrity or the value of human beings. That every human being is created in the image of God, and because of that, every human being is valuable. Even if they are sinful, that there's value, that they're created in the image of God. That God's print is on them. And as Christians, we're to live a life through the lens of the scriptures. But again, many people, many so-called Christians, they, they claim Christ, but they, they don't really look through a lens or live a life that's balanced looking at the world and interpreting it through the scriptures. They believe that God created them and, and, the, and God loves them, but, but business is business and God is God. Or, you know, the, this, this is this and this is that. We, we separate things and, and we have an inconsistent worldview. And again, there are many who say that we're created by chance. And morality is just something that, that, that's drummed up because we can live better lives if we have a, a moral system. But you pick it. Of course, when you say they're wrong, you go, no, you're wrong. They make judgments all the time based on, on the fact that there is no judge. We have inconsistency all over the place. But for Christians, we must understand what our worldview is and live a consistent life in light of what the Bible says life should be. Where we've come from and where we're going and how vital the dash is between our birth and our passing. That our journey is vital to God and how we live that out is our worldview. And living a Christian worldview is essential to live it out balanced with understanding of who we are and where we're going. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I mean, you still with me? If not, we have coffee in the back. Okay, it's not ready yet. It'll, it's cooking. But we, we want to live a consistent Christian life. The Bible tells us that we were created in the image of God and we were placed in paradise. But we were given this essential thing called a soul, unique from all the other animals. And we were created in the image of God, different from all the other animals. And we had this wonderful, but very scary principle and value within us to choose. Volition was put inside of us that we could choose and grasshopper chose poorly <laughs> for us older ones who used to watch the karate series rather it was the kung fu series 
And, 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 and so we're out of paradise. And the authority was taken away. And, and though we have authority on earth, that we've lost our place in the kingdom. But Jesus came to restore what was lost in Adam. When you come to Jesus, what's restored to you is new life, awaiting paradise. And not only that, but you have kingdom authority. You are granted an authority as a child of God to live this life with power. Not anemic sickness that so many of us live in. I'm part of that. I, I'm, not, I'm not yelling at you. I've got to go, Larry, if you believe this, and why do you do this? Or why, why did you say that? Or, or why are you so self-protective? Why can I be, and how can I be so cruel? Or, or, so, or so just passing someone's pain and, and just caring about something else. Why am I such a poor listener? And why, why do I have to always tell you my story even before you're done telling your story because I just got to talk about me? What is it about us that we have to really work at being who God wants us to be? Do I really believe what the Bible says? And of course, we're on this journey and we're helping one another do that. We're going to help each other understand what it means to walk in kingdom authority. Last week's verse is this, is this week's verse also. It is our launching pad to this understanding of what I'm calling kingdom authority. It's Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Let's stay with me because we're going to be riding some hills here. So let's hang on tight. Here's what it says in Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, that is Christ Jesus, according to his power that is at work within us, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all ask or imagine, according to this power that works within us, live your life. What a great power. What a great sensibility we have when our souls are awakened to God and we can now walk with him day by day, literally moment by moment. It goes on to say in this passage, and I'll read some quickly because we went over some of these, so I'm not going to reteach them, so to speak. But it says this in verse 4 in the book of Ephesians. It says, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ. Oh, we can be alive in this world, but now we're alive in Christ. There's a new power within us. We now walk in this kingdom authority I'm speaking about. Here's what it says in verse 19, just down from verse 4. It says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. We become part of God's people, part of his congregation it comes from the same word the church comes from ecclesia it's it's a greek word that means the gathering ones we become part of his gathering body and then in the verse 22 it says this and in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which god lives by his spirit this is the church and not only are we in him and he's in us but there is this there's this mysterious thing that goes on. In him, you too, you also are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives in his spirit so that within the gathering of God's people, wherever two or more are gathered in his name, there is this phenomena of the presence of God that is making us to grow together as a dwelling, as a oneness, as a unity, as a body of Christ. We, as you know, are in the midst of a, a plague. But it's more than a virus. It's a plague of soulish isolation and consequent fear. 
Never have I, again, uh, for those of you who may not know my background, I did primarily counseling, even as an ordained minister. I, was, I came out of graduate school in 1979 and, and, uh, and then went on and did some other things regarding my counseling degree. And so I, I counseled a lot. That's what I did. But never in my life's history, and I'm, I'm still a very young man. Yeah, I'm just finding out who's going to think different, Carl. Is that it's just a number, <laughs> yeah, a big number. Uh, I, I, I lost my place here. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what background? But, but I've, never, I've never seen, I've never heard of so much anxiety and fear and panic disorder as I do today. I mean, it is rampant. And, and, we're, and we're not, um, uh, as Christians, we're not removed from the ills of this world. It can, it can hit us as well. So how important it is for us to gather ourselves together, our wits, and to really work out these things that are trying to work their way into our lives. It's not always easy. Some of you struggle with some of these very things where fear overtakes you where terror and panic overtakes you. God forbid, I, I don't want that to happen, but it happens. And, and some of you, it's happened to you, and, and it just happened. It just came out of nowhere, you thought. But it doesn't. Nothing just happens overnight. It's a slow burn. We're not aware of the things that we're thinking inside. We're not aware of the, the choices we're making. We're subconsciously walking through life, and sometimes in our, our unawareness, we're embracing our stresses and we're embracing our fears. But we so much want to, want to put a, an external facade of health and togetherness and, and strength that, it, that, that, that that fear hits you like a brick right across the head. It just hits you hard because you were looking so good. And so when this stress magnifies and pops over, it's like you are the most afraid because you found your worth and your ability to be strong. But don't fear. Because even through that, God's going to teach you and God is going to raise you up with greater strength than before. It's okay. You'll learn to get through the fears. You'll learn to get through the panic. You're not alone. God isn't abandoning you. You're not going crazy. You just have this stuff that is stuffing your life. And God will work that through. Let me read some things to you here out of Psalm 119, 105. We are unique as Christians. The Bible says this, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When the Bible says this, and it says the same kind of thing in various places, it literally means this, The Lord is a ner in Hebrew. The Lord is a, a ner. It's like a lamp that is used to take one step at a time. It's that kind of word that is literally there to guide each step that I take. Thy word is a ner, a lamp unto my feet, and a light, that word is or in Hebrew, unto my path, which is a floodlight, a spotlight that goes out a long way. The Bible says that the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and that God is going to also show my future, what's out in front of me. That God is going to guide my path step at a time and even out 
beyond my steps. That's what God says his truth is to us. Now that's our world view, you see. That when we walk this life, we can walk in light of this reality. That God is this God for me. I need not fear. Okay, it's too late. Fear has overtaken me. Well, God's going to work through that with you. He's not through with you. But let's begin to think properly about our lives. That God is going to guide each one of our steps, but also is going to shed light out in advance, out in front of us. The Father also gives us internal light. It says this in Proverbs 20, 27. The human spirit is the lamp, the narrow of the Lord, that sheds light on one's inmost being. You know what that's called? A conscience. God has given you a conscience. He has made something alive in you that's now connected to him. It's not just this, this you know, guilt-ridden, you know, double thinking thing inside of me it is a conscience and the ability to see my inner motives my inner self in light of who God is sometimes it's a little scary because we go oh gosh I didn't know that was there you go ick but it's okay God knew it was there all along he's going to now help me work that through and sometimes kick stuff out Sometimes it's readjusting, but God is in me and he's giving me this thing called a conscience. It's connected to him so that I can have a good view of who I really am. You know what that always brings to you when you have a good and true view of who you really are? It's called humility. We walk differently when we, good, when we get a true picture of ourselves and not just the one we've drummed up. The human spirit is the lamp of the Lord that sheds light on one's inmost being. In the Hebrew Bible, it reads this way, the neshama of Adam is the ner of Hashem, searching all the innermost beten. The soul of Adam, the soul of Adam is the same kind of soul that's inside of me. And God has given me light in order to search my innermost being that I might be right with God. And it goes on to say that this innermost being, the beten in Hebrew, you know what that beten word is? It means my belly, my abdomen. You know, there are, there are more, uh, uh, there are, there are, you have what they're called, um, uh, they're not just ne neurons, but they're, um, I forget the term, but, but you have them. <laughs> you have hundreds of millions of them in your brain and you have probably 100 million of them in your belly you have more neurons in your belly than your dog has in its head we think with our bellies you know sometimes we go like this oh I have this weird feeling you're not too far off by that connection of your head to your belly that kind of thing that moves us, that happens inside of us, is connected to our brains. And sometimes that's telling me something. Be afraid. Be happy. Throw up. <laughs> These things are connected to our brains. Even the Hebrew uses this term regarding, as we search our innermost being, that our bellies are, are going to, to give us signs of good or bad or ick. Yeah, ick. That's a Greek term. <laughs> the Lord gave us mind and conscience. We cannot hide from ourselves, it says in another version. Here's another version. A man's conscience is the Lord's searchlight, exposing his hidden motives. You know, that's, that's a good thing. God, God doesn't show us hidden motives that we might get beat up, but that we might give them over to him and change and, and be more like Jesus. It, it's our opportunity to change and become more like Christ. The Bible says that through God all things were created, both visible and invisible. They were created through Jesus and for Jesus, for his pleasure, for his praise. 
That includes the birds that sing. That includes the crickets that chirp and the stars that twinkle and you and me. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. All things were created through him and for him. This is our worldview. We are to live our lives as men and women with conscience of conscience, created to love God and to be loved by him. And to understand that all things come from him. To not walk aimlessly or, oh, I wonder if there's a God. No, there is a God. And look at his expanse and the beauty and the wonder of what he's given us. Enjoy creation, but enjoy more the creator. God has given you a heart and a conscience to walk in light of this God who loves you and has created you for this place and for him. Now, because of sin, this place will change. And for sure, we want something more than what's here because what's here is tainted. But God is preparing a place for us in heaven. The Bible says this in the book of Romans, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ. So what's God's will for us? Another part of our way of thinking. And he's talking to the church. And maybe... Even though, even though we're a small church, take all of us, we're, we're a small church today, but, but nonetheless, as we look at the church, it's hard to be one. It's hard to be unified. But God desires it. And God is moving us towards that end. I mean, just look at the this, this small groups that you're a part of, families and, and, uh, and friends and, and neighborhoods, and how hard it is to be just one in those arenas the little micro churches that we have as, as, as we, before we come together, we have our little micro churches. And we struggle there with relationships and, and with, with brokenness and, and division and God says, stop it. Work it out. Here's what the Bible says. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony. Who grants you to live the harmonious way? The God of endurance and encouragement. God, we need to pull down from God to get what we need to live in harmony. But he's moving us to live harmoniously. Hold this thought just for a second because I want to go back to the idea of fear, anxiety, and panic, and stress, and all those things that so many people are struggling with today. Part of finding victory in that is becoming part of the awareness of your place in God's kingdom. Yes. And your place of kingdom authority in your personal life, but in the life that you have in the body of Christ. Satan wants you to be isolated. And he wants you to think that you're the only one who feels like this. You're nuts. You're nutty. <laughs> Don't let anybody know. Keep it to yourself. Make sure nobody finds out how much mental pain you have because mental pain is, ooh. Back off. Sit over there. Sit over there on the Lauren row. <laughs> Those are the mental people. You're all mental. We've all been affected by sin, not just your kidneys and your heart and your liver, but your brains. All of us are struggling with something. Our worldview is this, that God is going to work out those things for our good, and he's going to make us more like Jesus despite and in spite of those things. And that God wants you to be one, that God's going to take all of our stuff and work that out together in the body of Christ. We find healing in confession. You know what a confession means? Now, I'm going to tell you how bad I am. I'm going to tell better people than me how bad I am. We think of confession like that. I'm going to tell people that are much better than me about how bad I am so I can feel better about myself. Confession is just telling the truth about yourself. Confess your sins one to another and you'll be healed, the Bible tells us. 
It's telling the truth about your life. I get it. We're not just going to sit there and come, come throw up on me. But we want to work out truth in our lives. You want to get close enough to people in the body of Christ so that you can say, let me just tell you. We're going to talk about friendship at the end of this, so hopefully I can encourage you to, to grow. But, but here's the deal is that we're called to be honest and genuine people. Not fearful people hiding in the dark, pretending to be religious and better than everybody else. No. You are saved through Jesus because your sin, sin, sin is so bad you could never get into heaven without him. Nobody is saved because they're so good. Nobody. We're all saved because we're so bad. Our worldview is that we're all born with a sin nature. I've told you this many times. I have six little grandkids. They're the best, most beautiful kids in all the world. <laughs> Except for yours. <laughs> they're so beautiful, but you know what? We're always having to work out, man, their, their sin. <laughs> and, and how much each one wants to take over and be our God. <laughs> Everyone wants to be God. In charge. Everyone. We've got to teach them that no, we're part of a unit. No, that's bad. No, that's not good. Share. Oh, I know it's yours, but we've given it to you so you can enjoy it with others. Mine, 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 mine. We've got to train them and teach them because we're born in sin. Our worldview is that we're born in sin. We need God to live rightly and to fight the sin principle that wants, us, that wants to take us away. We draw down from God to get what we need to live in harmony and in unity with one another. <laughs> Let me move a little faster than I've been moving here. <laughs> Anxiety becomes a gift when it helps us depend on God. That doesn't mean we stop seeking help or hope or change. It doesn't mean that we, we know pursuing peace is a process. But we know that God is going to even use this to make me stronger and more dependent upon Him. So, is it possible to really live anxious for nothing? Yes. That doesn't mean there won't ever be anything to be anxious about. But because of Jesus, we can live anxious for nothing, even when there's something to be anxious about. Not by our efforts, but by his presence. In 2 Corinthians 10, it says this, For though we walk in the flesh, though we're still in our body form, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We are in a spiritual battle, and the battle are ideas that will take you from God. You know, there are a lot of bad ideas that are coming to fruition and it's making us a bad nation <laughs> if we let them take hold. Bad ideas have bad consequences when they're fleshed out. I just read a recent survey, a recent poll, saying that, that more than 50% of university students today believe that socialism is a good alternative. These are people that have never, obviously never, ever studied history. For there's not one, not one example in all of history that socialism or communism is good. Anywhere. Why would young people say, 
Oh, that's a good alternative, sure. Because somebody's telling them behind the scenes, we're changing minds with bad ideas. With, with no attachment to history, with no attachment to reality, but just this pseudo-intellectual crap that's hurting young people today. And why is it that we have young people who are Christian people, young people, who go to, who go to college and they come back messy, messed up? They, they've lost their way. I'll tell you why. Well, there's a lot of reasons. But let me give you one reason. Is that we were built and created for relationship. Real relationship. You can be in the church and know all the right answers. Jesus. <laughs> you can be in church and, and you can do all the right things, but not really be in deep relationship, either with people or with God. You see, God is calling us to be in relationship with Him and one another. Not this facade, but real relationship. God wants you to be intimate with Him. God knows you, and He wants you to know Him. The Bible says that we are to walk in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. We are to walk with Him this way. But so many go to church, and, and they don't have that depth of relationship, but they're longing for it. So you know what? When their first cute guy comes along, we go, oh, he's so cute, and he likes me. And so we engage in these bad relationships that are not Christ-like, but they're relationships, and we long for them, but it's a counterfeit if they're not believers. And not picking on women, it could be, you know, guys, you know, they, they just, they're, they're walking with the Lord, but boy, there she is, you know. And it's like, oh my gosh. You know, thank God my wife knew Jesus. I probably would have did anything stupid to get her. But by God's grace, she led me to Christ. By his grace. But she could have led me anywhere. <laughs> That's the truth. She could have led me anywhere. I would have went. Praise God that God's hand was on my life and on her life. And he led me to himself through her. If you hook up to the wrong person, you'll be led astray and you'll justify away faith. And they really don't love you that much. You know why? Because they, they say they love you and they know how much you talk about church and how much you love church, but they're, they're willing to take you away from it for themselves. That's the world we live in. I, I hear it and see it all the time. We must build rooted relationships with each other and with Christ. With Jesus primarily. But with each other, God has given us that we might walk in a way by which we're, again, strengthened by our friendships. You know what the Bible says? Oh, I'm sorry, the Bible didn't say this. You know what they say in sociology? They say that, that, that you will be like your five closest friends. They have studies that, that, that say things like that. Actually, they say that get your three best friends or closest friends, and you're an amalgamation of those three. <laughs> it, it's really that idea that, that you will be like your friends. I've said this to you before. I, I'll say it again. I, I say that eventually you're going to look like your dog. You, they just do. So if I was you, I'd go get a good-looking dog. Because eventually you're going to look like your dog. Now, the same, but even more so with friends. Whoever your friends are, you will be like them. You will be like your friends. I spent a lot of time praying, <laughs> praying that, that my, my kids would have good friends. As much as I prayed for them, I prayed for their friends. Didn't always work out the way I wanted, that's for sure. But God is faithful. And now our prayers are still being answered. 
And, and you know, there, there are many kids from that particular high school that are still part of our life. And they've come to know Jesus through our following Jesus. But how we need to grow in our friendships. You have a need to grow and nurture good friendships. Very few people want to spend their lives without friends. And if you do, it's because there's a sickness in you. And I understand that. Things happen in such a way that we're now very afraid or hurt or burned. And so now we've isolated. But that's what the devil wants you to do. Because God has made you for relationship. I'll close here in just a moment. How many close relationships do you have? I'm not talking about just acquaintances, but people who know you. Uh, people who, who know you and still love you. <laughs> there are some people who got to know you and they don't love you anymore. That's sad. But that's true. Friendship is a gift. And you had to treat it like that. I pray that you would grow friends in the body of Christ. People who are out for you good, who love you, and who learn to love you even when you're hard to love. And that you learn to love others as well. But friendship is hard work. I mean, real friendship. Honesty is hard, and, and grace is hard. But we draw down from God and get what we need to live a life that is consistent with our worldview, how we view people, God, and the world we live in. And God will give you what you need to live it rightly. It'll always be messy, but you can live it rightly. It says this in Galatians. Brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in a sin, point out their sin to them and rub it in their face so that they won't do it again. <laughs> what? <laughs> it doesn't say that, does it? It says this in Galatians 6 2. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Does the church do that? We think the church won't. So you know what? We don't share. We don't say anything. We just make sure we stay private. Sometimes we're not very gentle. It goes on to say this, brothers and sisters, if someone in your group does something wrong, is another version, you who are spiritual should go to that person and gently help make him right again. But be careful because you might be tempted to sin too. By helping each other with your troubles, you truly obey the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is important when he really is not, he is only fooling himself. It's this idea of if you, think, if you think that you're better than other people, and we do that as a means of self-protection, as soon as you do that, you're not. Maybe the worst sins are those internal prideful sins where our attitudes get in the way and we can't restore anybody. The Bible says, each person to judge his own actions and not compare himself with others. Then he can be proud for what he himself has done. Each person must be responsible for themselves, but you help one another. There's this idea, another translation that says, you know, help carry one another's burdens, but each person carries their own load. You can't carry that for them, but you can help them. We're all responsible before God, but you can help. You can be responsible to lighten what they carry. Let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for your constant presence. 
I come asking today, Lord, for peace that surpasses an understanding in anyone here who is struggling with fear or anxiety, that they might find kingdom authority in their identity as being your child. Lord, help us to see the enemy with clarity so that we're not caught fighting battles that don't make any sense. Lord, I pray that you'd be part of our lives in such a way that we are intimately acquainted and working through life with you. Lord, we give you all of our worries and fears this morning. Help us to be anxious for nothing and to depend upon you. Help us to trust you, Jesus, above all things. Certainly to trust you more than ourselves. Father, may we know your love. May we know your presence. May we walk in it. May we learn to be comfortable in your presence and walk with you moment by moment. And Father, we draw upon you to continue to make us one. In your name we pray, amen.